Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57-page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world-class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership, It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now, my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Tyza Evans, and Ty is the host of Grind, Sell, Elevate, a business podcast that I encourage everyone to check out, uh, and you're going to find out more about that and about Ty's life and his story. So welcome to the podcast, Ty. Oh, thanks, John. I'm happy to be here. So for our listeners, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, so I've... Uh... 
Yeah, my name is Tizer Evans, uh, originally from California, uh, now living in the great state of Texas uh, here in the States. Uh, I've been in sales uh, for, geez, I don't know, 17, 18 years now, although I'm not that old. So, uh, But I've worked in a lot of different capacities um, from a sales rep to a pod leader to shift, shift supervisor back in the day to running uh, extremely large sales teams um, and anything in between. So I've done a little bit of everything and all over the country. Yeah, um, that's that's amazing, and uh, I really want to encourage people to check out your uh, your podcast. So, can you just give us a <laughs> a quick sort of overview of what you do on Grind Sell Elevate? Sure. So, you know, Grind Sell Elevate was started with the intention of just putting out great sales content for struggling salespeople or people wanting to take to the next level, and then it kind of morphed. Um, in the last you know hundred or so episodes into me having really great guests that are experts uh, in their own right, whether it's SEO or sales or leadership. Um, and so now I do do kind of like this uh, type of uh, sit down and chat with people for thirty or forty minutes about what they're an expert in. Yeah, fantastic! It's um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's awesome, and and like I said, I encourage people to check it out. Um, so we'd love to find out a bit more about your story. So feel free to go back as far as you want, even even to childhood. What are some of those moments along the way that really shaped you becoming who you are as a leader, as a person, and uh, particularly as a thought leader in the sales field as well? Yeah, thank you. So I come from a really small town, um, Cloverdale, California, uh, which is at the heart of the wine country. So I, I grew up in the last city in Sonoma County for people who are familiar with Sonoma, Napa, and you know, we're world famous for the the vineyard. So I grew up there. Um, and, you know, it's just like a small town. I was joked that you could find here in Texas. Um, it's 5,000 people. I had three stoplights in my hometown. And then, um, you know, so I got heavily into sports because we were just bored all the time, right? We, it was 30 minutes to the next closest mall or movie theater. So uh, I think that was my first early on kind of um, introduction to being a leader, other than I'm the oldest brother of three. Uh, so beating up on my little brothers and bossing them around. Uh, but then, you know, in, in high school, I played football, basketball and ran track and and uh, and I was did speech and debate and was ASV vice president. And so, you know, kind of through those things, basketball as a point guard and football as a quarterback. So I kind of just naturally gravitated to positions of leadership, which then just helped my professional life. Um, but yeah, you know, I was just, uh, uh, again, small town kid, uh, country kid, grew up on the river, uh, grew up playing in the mud, had a lot of fun, um, and then moved to San Diego for college and got some city life. Yeah, in, uh, incredible. So when did you, I'm always interested to know for you, particularly with the sales uh, sort of uh, background that you have and the focus on your podcast, if we focus in on that, do you remember the first I guess, aha moment you had in sales that, that was really pivotal for you as a young person where you realized maybe this is, you know, maybe I'm, I'm really gifted at, you know, something that, that's ended up being really important or maybe further along when you had a, a, a significant breakthrough and went, wow, I could really, really um, sort of invest a lot of my life into this. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you, you know, I, Although so I had great parents and they were fully supportive, we just didn't have a ton of money growing up. And uh, so I, I worked full time while going to college full time when I moved to, to San Diego. And um, well, one of the jobs I took, uh, I think I was like a junior in college. So, you know, my last two years of college, I worked in the surf industry. I worked at a surf shop, the largest surf retailer in San Diego County. And what was unique about that position was that growing up, I'd always had a great work ethic. I'd been working since I was 13 or 14. I had my first job, but it had always been manual labor, right? So trading, trading time for money like we all do, but this is like serious time for money when you're stocking lumber or going to construction sites and hanging sheetrock and stuff like that. I, I scrapped on construction sites to you know, make 10, 12 bucks an hour as a kid. And I, so that's just kind of, that was the formative years of my working experience. So I got into college, same thing. I worked at a lumber yard. I worked for 24 hour fitness. And then I took this job at the surf shop just cause I thought I could talk to cute girls and I liked surfing. Um, and I did not know when I started there that they paid a commission. And so that thought was really cool. So I made like eight fifty an hour, but then I figured out if I sold, you know, X amount of clothing, I could actually make 20 bucks an hour. And so that mm. just really intrigued me. <laughs> and, um, and so that my first year doing that, I won a sales award when I was, you know, highly competitive as an athlete 
And um, I've always been a really competitive guy and I liked seeing my name on that leaderboard. And then I got recognized for it. It all kind of made sense. And then I stayed there my senior year, same thing. I was the number one producer in that store and I think top five in the company. And I said, yeah, I think I can, I can make some money uh, doing this. And uh, so that just, I didn't know what I really want, what I want to do with my degree. Cause it was just a kind of a BS degree, you know, communications. Uh, uh, so I said, Hey, I think this might be a good career path for me. Yeah. I love that. I love that you didn't realize there was commission and you just sort of went, Oh wow. And then uh, that's, that's become such a big part of your story and your life and your podcast is, you know, um, is being a thought leader in, in the sales area. And uh, I, yeah. And I, my background is actually in business development and sales. That was where I really had my first opportunities. And so I really love, love what you do and, and love how you're bringing a lot of wisdom to an area that I think can often be misunderstood. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely can be. Um, and the one thing I've tried to treat sales and, and I, and I think you can relate to this, that with anything I've tried to do in my life is that, you know, so many of us, when we graduate high school or college, our learning stops and, you know, for me, mm. I, I took it seriously. That I really wanted to, to hone my craft. And for me, you know, education is constant, constant learning. So, you know, why wouldn't I apply that to sales and or leadership, right? And so I took it very seriously at an early age and started reading sales books. And I would, I would seek out mentors uh, that were in positions that I wanted to be in. Any company I've worked at, I, I always gravitate to the top three people in that company. And I want to have sit downs with them. Uh, so I took it very seriously. Um, and it made me a lot of money very early on in my career by doing so. Yeah, I want to ask you about that first job. <laughs> and as you were really cutting your teeth in in sales, in like, uh, which is where I think you can learn so much in those, for, you know, in those sort of roles where it's really um, at the coalface. What what did you do? Are there any stories from that first job where you, where you first had your chance to actually go, oh, wait, so I can... Uh, you know, take the sort of same competitive spirit from track and field and actually bring that to helping, you know, give people value and, and, and get paid a commission. Are there any stories from that job that come to mind that were really aha moments for you or where you felt like you cracked the code or where you really dropped the ball and, and it stuck with you and, and taught you a lesson? Yeah, so it, I would not say it was at the surf shop. That was a great ride. You know, it was not challenging me to go up and talk to a mom who came, who came in to buy a T-shirt for her son, and she'd walk out with the surfboard and five pairs of shorts and a couple of shirts. You know, um, th that part was fun and just talking to people and and being relatable. But when I went to work for Enterprise Rent a Car uh, when I graduated college, because I, I knew that you know. Uh, working in a surf shop probably uh, was not going to be long term for me by way of income with the financial goals I wanted to, to have and had set for myself graduating college. So I went and worked for enterprise. I was actually, it was one of those first things where I, um, it took me by surprise because I was terrible my first six months and, and I couldn't figure out why I was struggling mm. so much. And so that was a big reality check. Cause I'd always been naturally pretty good at sports. School came really easy to me. My first sales quote unquote sales job was pretty easy. Right. And I worked really hard, uh, but I was really struggling. And, and so I went and I, and I met, um, with my regional rental manager, uh, his name was Larry Haley. And he just said, you know, uh, go seek out these three guys. Uh, they were in the same position as you. And, and, you know, now they're all in the top five out of the uh, 300 reps. So I did that. And the one thing I found that those guys did that other people weren't doing is they were constantly role playing between each other and their manager. And so, uh, they, they said, Hey, well, it's, so I said, well, can, you, can I do the same with you? And so they said, sure. And so I went out and I, and I just you know, started role playing and I started to get a little bit of confidence. And then I would take what I learned in the role play and I would apply it to real life. And then I got a few more wins and a few more wins. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed from there where you know, if you fast forward four months after that first six months, then I was in the top three out of 300. And so it was a big pivotal moment, kind of like the same type of connection that I had made with basketball was my sport, which I was terrible at. And I spent one summer uh, where I played anywhere from 48 hours a day. And then consequently, the next year I started, I got asked to play in a traveling team. I got bumped up a league, you know, but it was all because of my commitment to practice. And so that same kind of correlation happened uh, with sales. And although I didn't make a lot of money with enterprise, it gave me a lot of confidence moving forward with how to build rapport, and how to build perception to people and, and how to communicate with them quickly. Yeah, that's interesting. So 
tell me a bit more about the role playing. Like, what did that what did that actually look like? That you you went, you stumbled across these these three guys, you you sought them out, you asked them, you said, "Can I can I join? Can you just like um, explain what what that uh, what you actually started doing in terms of at the office in you know on the way to to calls? What sort of what what were you sort of role playing?" Sure. So for those of you that aren't familiar with enterprise, the way it used to be structured was the way that you had your promotability was on your ability to sell the extra insurance to protect the car, right? So you're basically selling against other people's insurance. You know, they, they have their insurance with Geico or Progressive. And you're saying, hey, don't do that. Buy the extra insurance from enterprise for, you know, 11 bucks or whatever it was. And then you're also trying to sell them into a better vehicle. Then you're also trying to sell them the prepaid gas, right? All these different little uh, profit centers. Um, and so a lot of times I, someone, I, you know, would do the pitch like, Hey, this protects the car bumper to bumper. And they would say, no, I say, okay. And then that was it, right? That was, <laughs> that was my, my thing. I always went for the <laughs> ask, but I did not always know how to combat it. And so these guys just taught me like, Hey, on every upsell or opportunity, take at least three no's. So that was kind of like the first thing that got implemented in my mind. So I knew from every mm. contract, I had to walk away with at least nine no's. And if you've never, uh, there's a great book, um, Go for No by Andrea Waltz, um, where she talks about this exact type of thing, you know, make sure yeah. you're counting your no's because if you're counting your no's, you know, eventually you'll get to the yes. Um, so, so when I started role playing with these guys, they would just have me, they would be different uh, avatars, different customer personas. And we would actually walk out to a car and I would go through the full pitch and they would make me go through the nine no's. And it just taught me a lot about how to think more strategically on my feet. Like um, if someone said, you know, I'm covered by my insurance instead of me saying, oh, okay. I would ask, well, what is your deductible? Well, my deductible is a thousand dollars. And so I said, Hey, you're going to be in the car for 24 hours. You know, Unfortunately, I've met a lot of great drivers, but I've never been able to one who can dodge a rock. So, you know, if you come back here tomorrow, my windshield's cracked. Are you, would you rather give me a thousand dollars or would you rather give me eleven dollars? Mm. And everybody can then recall a time that they've, you know, a rock's hit their windshield, and most people go, "Yeah, man, I, try, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to deal with my insurance yeah. and giving you a thousand dollars for a cracked windshield." So it was just those little shuttle shifts of how to just position myself and you know ask. Great questions. That's what a lot of salespeople miss, especially early on, is how to ask, you know, what I call power questions that keep the conversation going. So it's almost like they're doing the selling for you by you asking great questions. Yeah, I love that. They're doing the selling for you by you asking great questions. That's fantastic. Uh, fast forward through your career and, and with what you're doing now, um, what are some of the other pivotal moments where you? either felt like you broke through another ceiling or or had another sort of really significant learning that uh, that you look back on and go that that really was a game changer once I learned that or had that experience so, so you know I had always been in positions um, where I had to and I'm not going to go to right now this is kind of takes place in 2017 18 I made a big transition so I'd been with this company for about eight years and a lot a lot of our leads are what I would call still warm leads. Um, you know, it took convincing and whatnot, uh, but I, I went into a different type of market, still in the same uh, industry, uh, insurance, but I went to a different market where everything was cold outreach. And I had never really done that in my career. You know, normally when I'd called somebody and I stated who, what company I was with, they always gave me the time of day. Um, this company I went to and they were like, not only were they unfamiliar with the product, they were unfamiliar with the company, right? And we're always trying to accomplish three yeah. things to me in my mind in sales, right? I'm trying to sell them on me, my product, and my company. And, and if I miss any one of those pillars, I'm going to have a real tough time. And uh, the prior company, I heard the product and the company I had sold itself, right? It was just really getting them to trust and like me. In this scenario, I had to do all three. And that was 2017, 18. And uh, I made that transition. I moved from California to Georgia. I took a six-figure pay cut, uh, blew through 100 grand of our savings account to buy a house. My wife sold her business, so now we're on a single income. So it was kind of like my back was against the wall and I was doing something I'd never done before. And um, you fast forward um, a year later, 18 months later, and I was a rookie of the year and overall number six in the country. Um, and then was subsequently promoted about six months after that. And so that taught me a lot about who I am as far as my resiliency. It forced me to level up and to learn a different type of skill set and, ch and channel selling. 
and um, to get a lot better with cold calling and having cold outreach, getting around gatekeepers. And, 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 and consequently through that, I had three X my income in about 24 months as well. So it was a, it was a wow. real pivotal moment in my life uh, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, and so let me ask the questions for people who might be listening, who, who don't have much experience in sales, or I think there'd be a lot of leaders who haven't come from sales but who are really leaning in going, mm -hmm, I know this is what I need to do to grow my company, or I need to invest in people who can do this to grow my company. Um, so interested to know with the cold outreach, what was what, what were the biggest aha moments and learnings? And obviously if people want more depth, they can go and listen to Grind, Sell, Elevate, which would be great. Um, but what, are, what were some of the keys to being successful in cold outreach that you found? Well, to be honest with you, um, it's it's a couple of different things. One, it's it's a being consistent, obviously, first and foremost. You know, the average sales rep follows up two to three times and then they quit. But statistically, it's going to take you 10 to 15 times to reach your prospect for the first time. So uh, my best client wow. that I had from that job, I, I, <laughs> I called 17 times and I emailed 12 times before I ever got my first meeting. And I ended up wow. doing about $2 million worth of business with the guy. But a lot of reps would have given up, right? So the first thing was the the, the consistency. Um, and then once I got the person on the phone, again, it really came back to asking great questions. Um, having done my homework a little bit about who they were, right? Understanding, hey, you've been around in business for 40 years. Start to ask uh, great questions about what they've been doing with risk financing or how they position themselves with certain type of clients. One of my favorite questions to ask people is how do you separate yourself from the competition? Um, because then it gives you an avenue and it allows you to step in to show how you may be able to help uh, enable them to actually separate themselves from the competition. Because you, you typically you'll hear the same two or three answers from everybody. They think that they're separating themselves, but they're just the same as their competitor down the street. So you can really be, be start to become a trusted consultant because you can say, hey, you know, I really respect that and appreciate that. And I'm glad that you leaned into that. You know, but I got to tell you, I've, I've, I work with three of your competitors and a lot of them have that same type of uh, what they would say is their value proposition. And what I want to really want to talk to you about is how you can truly start to differentiate yourself by doing X, Y, Z. And then you start to, you start to gain that trust. Um, so, so that helped um, a lot. Um, and then also, you know, say lastly, start to meet people where they're at. You know, one of my favorite books is by a great Australian, uh, Tony Hughes. Um, and he wrote a book called Combo Prospecting. And it's just, yeah. you know, a lot of us get si siloed into one vertical, right? We're, we're just all phone. Or we're all email, or we're all Twitter, or we're all Instagram, and so um, or we're all LinkedIn. And I just want to hit it. I want to hit them from all angles, and that's something I learned from Grant Cardone. I'm going to hit you with an email. I'm going to hit you with a call. I'm going to hit you on Twitter. I'm going to hit you on LinkedIn, right? I'm going to hit you with a, <laughs> a a video email. I'm going to hit you with a podcast. So I'm going to come at you from a lot of different angles and try to meet you where where you're at. And and that I found that to be very helpful and effective. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, the nine no's really stuck with me that you just mentioned before. Um, once again, just for those who don't, who aren't, you know, experienced in that, one of the questions that popped into my mind is obviously when, normally when you get the first no, people are, people are afraid of keeping on pushing and then having the person be like, you know, why, you know, why are you being rude? Like, this is what people are imagining in their minds, right? Like that rejection or, or sure. being, you know, which I guess can happen time to time, but can you just explain how, um, I, I guess the real basics of what's a leader listening who might be, there might be a really big prospect that they're going to meet with um, that could be a game changer for their company or something. When someone says no, I know you unpacked a little bit this, of this already, but what are some strategies to, to not just keep asking the same question? Do you know what I mean? Like not just keep saying, so yeah. will you do this? And they go, no, again and again. I, I know you can do it way differently. How do you do that? Well, um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a really good question. It's, it is definitely about keeping them in the sales loop and, and doing that very tactfully. And the first part of where that comes from is what I was talking about before is practice. You know, this is where you've really got to appreciate your craft and you have to prepare for those situations. And a lot of reps, they're fearful of the no because they haven't prepared to get it. And then they don't know what to do when they do get it. And so for me, it's all about repetition. And so there's, you know, there's only so many different types of rebuttals um, or objections that a, a client's going to have. You know, your company's probably identified the, 
you know, 10 to 15 that are going to be most common. And you just need to have those practice and rehearse so well that it does come out natural and, you know, record yourself uh, on, on your phone, right? Practice in the mirror, get with your wife or husband and practice with them, you know, get with colleagues. It, for me, the, you know, last year when I was a sales leader, my team, we met every day at eight, to eight to eight thirty. Every day we did sales training. It's a non-negotiable wow. for me to do sales training every single day. And people said, yeah, hey, you're crazy. I said, yeah, but we're 174% to goal in the middle of a pandemic. So who's crazy? Mm, right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so, so it's really, it's really about being prepared and understanding what those common rejections are. And then how do you handle those objections in a non-offensive way? And so usually that's by asking better questions. And so it's usually when I get a no, I, I go right back to another question, you know, and, and ultimately mm. it, it, you know, one of my favorite questions is like, I really feel like, you know, Jono, this is something that resonates with you. And I can see that you're a bit hesitant, which I totally appreciate. It's a big decision that for you to make, you know, but I, I got to ask you, what didn't I explain to you to make you feel comfortable with saying yes today? Mm, that's a great question. You know, it's, it's an mm. honest question and people appreciate honesty. People appreciate you being direct if you do in a non-confrontational way. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's gold. You can put that on the wall. <laughs> that's so good, Ty. What about, um, uh, interested to know for you when you, you know, one of the things that people hear a lot about is this idea of, um, you know, when you ask, when you ask for the sale pause and don't be the first person to speak interested in any of those sort of phrases like that, where you have either busted the myth or you found actually that's, that's such a common saying because it's hundred percent true. No, it is hundred percent true. So that's something that I've always taught sales reps and I do myself to almost to the nth degree where I've had a, you know, a lot of people shadow me over the years. And that's the one thing that they will, they'll say usually two things about me that I have a unique ability to make people feel very comfortable, very easily. And the second thing is, man, you hold those pauses. You make it uncomfortable. I said, yeah. <laughs> because I'm not uncomfortable, but I know the other person is. And eventually they're going to say something. And then when they say something, I'm going to continue to be quiet because then they'll continue to talk, right? And then now we're back in the dialogue. So I'm a huge proponent of just being quiet. Um, and again, if it gets very uncomfortable and you think they've completely shut down, then you need to have a good question. And that and, and I have, for me personally, and I've done this exercise with my team, uh, a lot of fun, is you go through and you have 10 to 15 power questions that you know are not yes or no questions and that will spur an answer that will create dialogue. Uh, so if you do get that awkward awkwardness where someone's just literally not going to talk anymore, then go to one of those power questions. But I, I'm a huge believer of just staying absolutely silent and they will keep talking. Yeah, that's great. I love, um, actually, it's, it's, it, there's a real similar similarity between sales and a lot of the um, executive coaching that I do where you, one of the things that I love is actually counting in my head to force myself to do a long pause. And for me, I, I'll i pause for 15 seconds and I'll give some sort of verbal cue after five mm. and 10 seconds. But that, and that's, that's not in a sales setting. This is in a setting where I am, I am getting better and better and it's hard, but living and being in that uncomfortable silence, knowing that the other person sitting across from me or on the phone or on Zoom, this is the moment they're having a revelation and I need to get over my uncomfortableness. And I think it's um, it's a really similar challenge in sales. I probably found it easier in coaching than sales, um, which which is interesting. I think probably because it's less confrontational. You know, I'm, I'm helping them work through something and, and I already have the relationship with them, but I see a big overlap um, there. And actually that's, that's just interesting that, that, that you, that you actually are such a big proponent of that. Cause that's, uh, that's really helpful. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things that people talk about, but to me, I've always felt like it was a little bit of a superpower that's not acknowledged uh, enough in the sales space. You know, just, just ask a question, shut up. That's, it's just as simple as that. <laughs> So I have to ask, uh, what are some of your favorite, you've already mentioned one great question, any other favorite questions? And uh, for people who might be, uh, sorry to put you on the spot like this, but is there anything that 
um, you, that you've written or any content that you have around that that people might be able to go and find as well? Or I guess listening to your podcast would be a good one because um, a list of questions is uh, is like gold. Obviously, you want to tailor them to your context, but I've asked you a few questions there at once. Yeah. So, the, I, yeah, mine really pertain. So, uh, you know, one of the things I read, I think it was in Anthony Annarino's book, uh, Eat Their Lunch, uh, another phenomenal sales book, that you, you want to cultivate questions or, around your prospect's blind spots. And I've always found it to be really helpful. What are they missing in their business that they don't know that they're missing? And so I try to come at it from that perspective. You know, my competition is calling. My competition is subpar. They're asking the same lame questions. Uh, you know, what's your current mm. pricing? Uh, who yeah. are you currently using? You know, people go as far as to ask, what are your pain points? Don't ever ask that as a salesperson. Don't ever ask somebody what their pain points are. You're already supposed to know that, right? So <laughs> uh, I, I, I try to come at it and really truly understand. And this is why I think that, you know, for me, it's maybe easier because I'm in one particular vertical, but I really think about their blind spots, you know, uh, talking to them about client retention. Uh, talking about employee retention, right? If you're in the HR space and then what are innovative solutions? What can you bring to the table that you know your competition isn't? And so sometimes that may be, I work with a lot of CFOs. Um, and so I, you know, I, I present for CFOs and CEOs a, a daily. And so I'm constantly uh, like challenging them in a very nice way on how they're uh, mitigating their risk financing when it comes to their insurance. And so I get them thinking about, well, what, talk to me about your 10 year, uh, your, your three, five and 10 year strategy when it comes to your risk financing, when it comes to your, your insurance, which is typically the second biggest line item for an employer. They mm. do not usually have a good answer for me, right? They're like, yeah. well, we, we review this once a year with our broker. Great. So you, you currently don't have a long-term strategy. No, we don't. Well, you know, let's talk about how do we start to... Uh, hedge future liabilities. None of my competition is talking to them like this. And so this starts to separate me. Now I become, you know, the thought leader in the room. I become the expert, you know, before they saw me as a salesperson. Now they're very interested, intrigued what I have to say. So it's just, again, it's just mm. teeing up right questions that are specific to your, your customer avatar and helping yeah. them and exposing blind spots and, and ways that you can solve those issues for them. I love that. That's such a great, um, that's such a great perspective on it. How can I, what questions can I ask to really zero in on blind spots that my, um, that, that, you know, that this prospect might have. Um, well, let's jump into Leadership Express. I've got a few questions to ask you, Ty. This has been, I've really focused in on the sales, but I've done that because I know that I, I just know there'll be leaders listening who this is something for them they really wanted to grow in. So I really appreciate you. We could have talked a lot more about you as a leader because I know that you, you're, you're, um, and, and sales and leadership, there's a lot of crossover, but I appreciate you chatting so much about sales. I couldn't help but just keep asking questions. So, uh, but let's yeah, talk about no, some, no, it's all good. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about some leadership questions. So, what is a book? And this could be sales or leadership or anything. What's a book that you gift that you've gifted to others? Sales and leadership in particular, right? Um, so I'll just I'll, I'll answer that in two parts. So the, the book I've gifted the most in the world is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. So it has nothing to do with sales or leadership, but it's just mm. a great personal development book. Yeah. Um, the, the the book I would I, I I've gifted the most um, for, for leadership is by Jocko Willink, uh, Extreme Ownership. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great book. Um, gee, they're they're and, two brilliant recommendations. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think, you know, the, the book with Jocko, he has another excellent book, uh, Leadership Strategies and Tactics, which I think, that, you know, he has a phenomenal way of uh, creating that into a field manual where you can pop to different sections and he'll teach you kind of how to walk through difficult situations in a page or two and how to ask great questions. But what I love about extreme ownership is because I just, I feel that we need more leaders to like really, to really own the bad, right? You know, a lot of us, uh, that are out there in a leadership position. When things go sideways, we typically tend to blame our team or the rates or the market or the leadership above us as opposed to just owning it. And I think that you get a, you generate so much more respect from your team when you step up and you say, yeah, I screwed up, man. I, I didn't prepare us the way we should have been prepared to go out and do battle. And so I, I'm going to own that and we're going to fix it. And this is how we're going to do it. 
Yeah, brilliant. I love that. Love that perspective. Um, so another question, what's a recent leadership lesson you've learned for the first time or been reminded of? I, I think definitely for me, um, been reminded of to make sure that you are always empowering your people, right? P people, oftentimes when people get put in a position of leadership, they can have a habit of uh, micromanaging their people to death, right? Because they know how to, they know how to do things and they want everybody to do it their way because their way is the way that it should be done because they're the leader. <laughs> and I've always found that um, empowering people to do things their way, as long as we all get to the same goal, uh, shows them that you trust them, um, you empower them. And, you know, at the end of the day, like I, I think for me, I took my first big leadership position when I was 27 and I was managing people that were uh, 25, 30 years older than me. They, they had kids that were my age. So, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to come down on them. They're an adult. I, you know what I mean? And so I just needed to be their biggest cheerleader, empower them, you know, take unnecessary problems off of their plate and let them flourish. And I think a lot of leaders get get caught up in not doing that and actually uh, doing more harm than good uh, by micromanaging people uh, to death. Yeah, that's great advice. Wonderful advice. Uh, what's a piece of advice, a great piece of advice that you've received at some point? Well, I've had, I've had, a, I've had a lot, you know, I've had, um, I've been, I've been blessed with some great people in my life. Um, you know, I, a, a couple that really come to mind, um, is, uh, you know, take it, just take it one day at a time, right? You know, you gotta have your, your big long-term visions, uh, but every day you just bite off a little piece. And and so every day I, and I come to, to, to work, I have a power list, um, they're non-negotiable items that I know they're going to move the needle for me. And so I knock those out first, usually three to five items. Um, so th th those little things like that, you know, just focus on the day. And if you, if you win every day, you can't lose. There's a gr great quote I heard Andy Frisella say. Um, mm, that's so I good. think that's, you know, just a message for me, you know, just focus on the day, be present. A lot of us got anxiety about the, the future, or, you know, we're bummed out about the past, but you know, none of that exists, right? So be present, be in the moment and, and do what you need to do today. If you win, what was that Andy Frisella quote? If you win every day, you can't lose. That's correct. Yeah, that's great. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, a movie or TV show that really impacted you? Man, that's, that, that is a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think the one that probably – that impacted me the most that I've watched a million times is um, probably Forrest Gump. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's just a that's just such a good movie, isn't it? Yeah, you know it really is. I mean, his whole journey, and I think the the big part of that for me is uh, he was just fearless, right? And so many of us we we end up having small mediocre lives because we're like scared of our own greatness. And although mm. he had every reason to be scared of himself and to not try anything and to stay in his little home in Alabama, he almost, he couldn't get in his way. Like he, he couldn't help his greatness because he had no fear to walk into the unknown where so many of us don't. Um, and look how beautiful his life turned out. Yeah, that's a great, another great recommendation. Okay. Last question. Um, if you were sitting down with a young leader, what, and you could only give them one piece of advice. What would you give? What would you say to them? You know, try not to see yourself um, as a as a person in position of power. You know, just try to see yourself as one of the guys on the team uh, that maybe has more uh, more you know power on approvals and whatnot. But I say, you know, get in the trenches with your team and get to know your team. Uh, one of the best things I've done with every team that's been instrumental and in, and in I feel like what's been my little bit of success is that I sit down with every single person, whether it's sales or service related, and I have them write me out um, their goals. Uh, three goals that are personal and three that are professional. And then we sit down and we draw out a roadmap on how they're going to execute those goals. And then once a month, I hold uh, one-on-ones for anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes with each of those individuals on my team. And we review if they're on track to hitting their personal and professional goals. And when you do that, 
you start to understand who you're working with and why they're working. And then you understand mm. how to communicate better with them. You know how to influence them better. Because, all right, you know, John Maxwell talks about all leadership is is influence, right? And if I'm able to understand yeah. that this person doesn't care about this job because they have a dream of starting this X business on the side, good. I want to help you fulfill that dream. How do we do that? You have their 100% mm. complete buy-in every single day. They will fall on the sword for you if you help them fulfill their dreams. Yeah, that's that's wonderful advice and uh, and a great place to land. For those who've uh, just really loved hearing you chat today and want to reach out to you online or follow you, and, and uh, can you just uh, give us some notes about where people can find you? Oh, sure. So a uh, cool part about my name, probably like yours, uh, well, at least here in the States, uh, not a lot of ties or Evans. Uh, so you can find me on all social media platforms, uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, believe it or not, I do have one, even at 37. Uh, no dancing, though. Uh, just at, at Tizer Evans on, on all platforms, you'll be able to find me. Excellent. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. A bit of a different episode today, but like I've mentioned through the episode, I think this is an area, from my experience, that a lot of leaders uh, you know, are self-aware to realize I need to grow in this and uh because or i need to just understand it better so i can lead great people in this space so i believe it's it's been absolute gold um don't forget as well listeners you can check out the john o white leadership podcast and also leadership question of the day where i ask you a different question every day to put a stone in your shoe and just make you a bit uncomfortable as a leader and, and help you grow but i want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to ty uh for coming on and and sharing just like well it, it feels like you could um you could take some of the advice you shared today and, and it'd be a pretty good start to a real, a really like if, if someone particularly who wants to grow sales for, uh, you know, as a leader out there in any organization applied, just a couple of the things you said, I feel like it would be a game changer. So I don't take that lightly. It's been, uh, it's been awesome just to have your wisdom on the show. Thank you so much for, for coming on, Ty. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I sincerely appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders and you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time 
And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O. White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.